One might have thought that a government which cost tens of thousands of lives by moving late into a lockdown would be more cautionary coming out of it. But no, with coronavirus still present in the community and with a world-beating test and trace system still months off, Boris Johnson yesterday announced that Britain will be coming out of hibernation and our streets will be bustling again. Is he playing with fire? To discuss that question on tonight's Tisky Sour, I'm joined by Dahlia Gabriel. How are you enjoying Britain's heat wave? Oh, it's so amazing. I'm like, I'm made for the sun. So I'm just like having the best time while all of my paler friends are struggling. But this is like my thriving temperature. So I'm doing great. Oh, yeah, you really, you really are glowing. I wasn't expecting quite such a positive answer, but I really believe it when you said that. <laughs> Um, we also have, as well as Dahlia, a free top tier guest interviews for you on tonight's show. We'll get Independent Sage member Gabriel Scally's view on the end of the lockdown, insight from Jacobin's Megan Day on progressive victories in last night's congressional primaries in New York and Kentucky. And Professor Anand Menon will give us his analysis of the latest in Brexit negotiations. Yes, they still are happening and they still really do matter. Um, of course, if you'd like to get in touch with us with your thoughts on any of the topics from tonight's show, you can do so on the hashtag Tisky Sal. We'll read out some comments, some questions, and give us your super chats as well. Of course, share the link to tonight's stream on social media. Yesterday in Parliament, Boris Johnson announced that Britain's lockdown will end on the 4th of July. Let's take a look at him summing up his argument in Parliament yesterday. Today, we can say that our long national hibernation is beginning to come to an end and life is returning to our streets and to our shops. The bustle is starting to come back and a new but cautious optimism is palpable. But I must say to the House it would be all too easy for that frost to return. And that is why we will continue to trust in the common sense and the community spirit of the British people to follow this guidance, to carry us through and to see us to victory over this virus. So what will Britain coming out of hibernation look like? We can get up some of the key revelations, the announcements that the government made yesterday. So restaurants will open, but with dividing screens and cut down menus. Two households can meet indoors with overnight stays permitted. There is the two metre social distancing rule will be relaxed at one metre with mitigating measures. Pubs and bars will offer table service only with strict limits on numbers. Wedding services will be back on, but capped at 30 people. Staycations will be encouraged with hotels, campsites and holiday lets reopening. Haircuts are back on, but nail bars and beauty salons remain closed. And swimming pools and gyms will still not be open. Um, so this all is, you know, with, 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 with modifications, a significant loosening of the lockdown. Um, but whilst Johnson was talking about getting the country bustling once again, cautious optimism and encouraging us back into the nation's pubs. The UK's chief medical officer took a more cautionary tone. This is Chris Whitty at Tuesday's Downing Street Press briefing. On an uptick, uh, if people don't take the mitigation seriously, if people hear a distorted version of what's being said that says this is all fine now, it's gone away, and start behaving in ways uh, that they normally would have before this virus happened, Yes, we will get an uptick, for sure. So it is absolutely critical people stick to the guidance that's been given. It's a changed guidance, but there are still very significant restrictions socially, and there are very significant restrictions on business of different sorts. It's really critical we do that. There may well be upticks anyway. There certainly will be local outbreaks, as the Prime Minister has said. Uh, that is to be expected uh, with this. Personally, am I, uh, am I comfortable with it? This is a balance of risk. It's like many things in medicine. You don't go for operation unless you absolutely have to. It's a balance of risk. Uh, and uh, I think that this is a reasonable balance of risk. It is not risk-free, absolutely not risk-free. Nobody thinks it is. And we may, at some point, say that particular bit of the decisions that were taken is too much of a risk in, with the benefit of hindsight, and we have to go back on it. But it is a balance of risk informed by uh, reasonable professional judgments. Uh, as Patrick has said, the job of advisers is not to sign things off. It is to give advice. 
So as was announced yesterday, that will be the final daily Downing Street briefing. So potentially the last time the swashbuckling positivity of Boris Johnson will be restrained by people with a handle on scientific evidence and a grip on reality. You'll note in that video how keen Witty was to insist that his job is not to back any policy proposal, but rather to deliver advice. No longer will they tolerate all of the flack being you know, absorbed by them when the government messes up. Some context for that was uh, reported in the Times this morning. Let's take a look at that now. Um, so they said, it is understood that Johnson was presented by the scientific advisory group on emergencies with two options for the latest relaxations, another phased reopening or a more comprehensive version. The prime minister chose the latter option, despite fears that if it goes wrong, it would be harder to discern which of the changes restarted the epidemic, potentially putting Britain back in the situation it faced in March. So you can see with that context why the government scientists are very clear to say it is not us making this call. We, you know, if they, they, they can't now say the science was wrong. That's why we got it wrong. This is the government making this decision. Um, to find out how risky Johnson's latest move might prove to be, earlier I spoke to Gabriel Scali. He's president of epidemiology and public health at the Royal Society of Medicine and a member of Independent SAGE. I started by asking Gabriel if Johnson, with this new announcement, was playing with fire. I think it's in a dangerous position. They, there are two real things need to be in place before restrictions should be reduced. One is that the virus should be under control. And it's not because the estimates have it at three, anything up to 5,000 new cases per day. That's brand new cases occurring in England every day. And the second thing, there really needs to be a case finding, testing, tracing, isolation and support system in place in every local area. And it certainly isn't. In fact, the, the leaders of uh, NHS test and trace, as they call their bit of it, believe it won't be up and running properly until the autumn. This test and trace system has become a real political controversy. So in Parliament today, Starmer and Johnson were trading blows about whether Britain was ahead or behind of comparable nations. I don't know what you make of this. Is, is Britain behind in terms of contact tracing or does our system look much like it does everywhere else? Well, I don't think it looks anything like it does anywhere else. And of course, we're behind because we stopped doing it on the 12th of March, which was one of a whole series of really very, very crucial mistakes that were made by the government at that time. Uh, on the 12th of March, they decided to stop doing community testing and tracing and pivot all of their laboratory capacity uh, to the NHS. So it was only it's only been taken up in the last couple of weeks. And it's it's uh, it needs to be a well oiled, uh, rapid responding machine that can get through the work very quickly get tests done extremely quickly, get them analysed very quickly, get the contacts traced very quickly. The best way to do that is at local level, but there's been very little emphasis on local NHS bodies, local authorities, and all of the resources locally that could be mobilised uh, to do the job. It's not there yet. And you sit on yeah. Independent Sage, and as far as I understand, you've been quite critical of every easing of the lockdown, every, every every new announcement that Johnson's made to say, let's all get out a bit more. But it also seems as if cases are still going down. So sort of in retrospect, do you feel like maybe you have been a bit too conservative or do you still think that the, the government are, are being way too gung-ho? Oh, I think you only have to look at the death toll, one of the highest death tolls in the world. And uh, the performance has been appalling for an eventable, a preventable disease in a country that used to, until relatively recently, pride itself on its performance in public health and its public health system. So it's been an atrocious performance, which is why Independence Age came into being, to provide a, an open, questioning, scientific approach and to, and to talk to ordinary people about these matters. And we've had a phenomenal response from people. And I think we've had an effect if only to get Sage to uh, publish things like the membership of the official Sage Committee and publish some of its minutes, etc. I have no idea why they took and are taking such a secretive approach. For example, the Joint Biosecurity Centre. You can't find any information about that. What, what, what is it they're scared of, that the virus is going to find out? 
In terms of the lockdown, going back to that specifically, what measures would you like to see? Do you think we should basically not be easing at all? Or do you think that Boris Johnson is just doing too many things all at the same time? What decisions what? would you like him to have announced yesterday? Well, I think it's very confusing because uh, if I asked you to list all of the things that are going to happen on the 4th of July, I'm sure you couldn't tell me because it's really complicated and it's really confusing. And if I know anything from 40 years in the public health business, it is when you're dealing with a difficult issue like this, particularly an outbreak or a, a, a real emergency, that your messaging has to be very clear and very direct and very easily understood. And that's how you get people to, to, to go along with you. This, I think, is such a mixed bag of things. I prefer we were taking imaginative approaches, making use of firstly that it's the summer and we can all be outdoors a bit more and that includes school kids. So should we should be having open schools and getting kids back into open schools where the risks of transmission would be very much lower. Making use of all the marquees and temporary buildings that, that aren't being used because there are no weddings going on uh, and making, if necessary, taking over uh, private school playing fields and other open spaces in order to get children moving and teaching and, and, and learning again. And a much more imaginative approach is needed. And at the, at the heart of it all, they have to invest locally in the testing and the tracing and the case finding. So that was Gabriel Scali, President of Epidemiology and Public Health at the Royal Society of Medicine, a member of Independent SAGE. Um, Dahlia, what did you make of of what Gabriel was saying, but also these announcements. I mean, I especially liked the point that Gabriel made there. That wasn't so much this is about whether or not we should lift the lockdown, but why are the government not being more creative when it comes to how we do it? So, for example, it does seem it just seems pretty unnecessary for us to be being encouraged to go back into pubs when we can very safely all have a beer in the park. The only argument for why you go into the pub is because people make more profit there and the government don't want to cough up the cash to mean that pubs can survive whilst we're all just drinking tinnies. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is very clearly an economic calculation. So that would be the case for, as you mentioned, an example being the pubs, but also when you look at, for example, the reduction of the two metre social distancing rule to one meter now the scientific evidence and indeed the government's own scientific advisor chris witty uh who we saw kind of trying to back off and sort of um create a bit of distance between him and the government's decisions today uh we saw you know we know that reducing from two meters to one meter can have can result in up to 10 times higher of a transmission rate but the reason that we've gone from two to one meter is because it means more people can be in shops, in pubs, in, you know, hairdressers, et cetera, at any given at any given time. And I completely agree with um, what was said before. You know, this really seems like a continuation of a lot of the problems with the first attempts to um, that we've seen throughout, actually, the government's coronavirus strategy, which is both unclear public messaging so we have you know the scientific advisors and you know Boris Johnson taking very very different tones um, but also uh, taking decisions that we don't have the infrastructure to supplement so recently uh, we saw with the whole argument around reopening schools for example we saw the government saying that we will have a situation whereby it will be 15 pupils per classroom. So schools can reopen if we have 15 pupils per classroom without talking about how they were going to provide enough classrooms and resources and teachers in order to make that adjustment and not putting vulnerable teachers at risk as well. And also relying on fantastical ideas, such as the idea that one lone teacher could keep two meters distance between you know a bunch of reception age kids. So this kind of... Um, taking decisions before the plan is actually made and the infrastructure is actually built seems to me to be the key trend um, that we're seeing. And that's exactly the same with the fact that we don't have the infrastructure to, for example, test people at work um, or do community testing. We don't have the reasonable infrastructures in place to do the amount of testing and tracing that we need in order to make this uh, lockdown easing happen in a safe way. There was an interesting moment in PMQs today 
uh, I mean, that, that, that was a bit strange to watch. I find you, you watch them, there's this debate, and then people on Twitter sort of come out with these sort of arbitrary which one won, and you can never quite guess who's going to have what take. It all seems a bit meaningless sometimes. Uh, but there was a good exchange uh, where Keir Starmer was sort of grilling Boris Johnson on why the Test and Trace app was not yet here, given that they'd said it would be so central to the scheme. Boris Johnson said, name one country that has an up and running contact tracing app. Keir Starmer said, Germany, 12 million people have already downloaded it. Um, so the idea and, that and South Korea have, as well. Yeah, well, South the, Korea South has Korea, one as well. The, yeah, they they had an app earlier on, but I think it was based on slightly mm. different technology. But in terms of this oh, this maybe. generation of mm. new apps, I think what well, Germany have got there earlier. We 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 went down a sort of route which ended up failing. Britain always likes to go it alone and always comes up short. I'm afraid. Um, We've got 12,000 watching. Let's get it to at least 1,500 while we are live. I know it's sunny outside, but you still need to get your news. Um, we are going to go on to our next story. In 2018, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez beat longtime incumbent Joe Crowley in a congressional primary and U.S. politics was transformed. Now another progressive insurgent looks set to displace a senior House Democrat in New York. Primary elections took place in the state yesterday, and with 85% of precincts reporting in New York's 16th congressional district, Jamal Bowman led the incumbent Representative Elliot Engel by 61 to 36%. Bowman, like AOC, was backed by Justice Democrats. Engel, in contrast, is a 13-term senior Democrat and chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He received high-profile endorsements from Hillary Clinton, Chuck Schumer, and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, he had the whole establishment behind him. But it looks like Bowman won. And this is Jamal Bowman speaking on Tuesday night as the results rolled in. Poverty is by political design and is rooted in a system that has been fractured and corrupt and rotten from its core from the inception of America, especially over the last several decades. So poverty and the impact of poverty on our children and dealing with issues of institutional racism and sexism and classism and xenophobia and everything that keeps the majority of us oppressed is what we designed this campaign to fight against. So tonight as we celebrate, we don't just celebrate me as an individual, we celebrate this movement, a movement designed to push back against a system that's literally killing us. It's killing black and brown bodies disproportionately, but it's killing all of us. So Bowman was not the only progressive that made gains last night. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez herself in her primary blew her challenger out of the water. There are many people uh, in the Democratic Party who have wanted to displace her for a long time. And it looks like their project has wholly failed. Uh, Mondaire Jones looks set to win New York's 17th congressional district. Many more across the United States to talk about um, this progressive upsurge, which was, I suppose, very welcome after the disappointment of well, the end of the Bernie Sanders campaign, I spoke to Jack Amid's Megan Day on what the results mean for the future of progressive politics and socialism in America. I began by asking her whether Jamal Bowman is really the new AOC. I mean, I hope so. I don't know if new AOC is the appropriate terminology because the hope is that Jamal Bowman will join AOC in Congress and we will grow our bench that way. Um, there's actually a really interesting detail here, which is that Elliot Engel, who was Jamal Bowman's opponent, sought to strip Ilhan Omar, who is another one of our very strong progressives in Congress, our very small bench of very strong progressives in Congress, uh, Engel uh, sought to strip her of committee appointments. And this appears to be some kind of comeuppance. It does, it does seem like the, uh, the establishment Democrats are facing serious challenges, and this can actually be incredibly salutary for the left in Congress. And Bowman is a, is a great addition, and we're, I mean, we're, we're enthusiastic. We're really excited. And so Bowman's being compared to AOC, but he's not the only person who looks like they might be set to head into Congress in 2020. Can you talk about some of the other races that happened across the country yesterday and who we should be looking out for? Yeah, and this is not about uh, you know U.S. Congress, but this is about uh, sort of our state legislatures, and this is I think a source of real excitement as well, which is that the New York City uh, Democratic Socialists of America ran a slate of six candidates 
for the state house. Actually, one of them was for Congress and she lost, but the rest of them, almost all of them swept. I think two of them lost very narrowly and the rest of them won. And so they will be going to the New York State Senate and the New York State House. And these are unlike Bowman. Bowman is, a, you know, he's willing to call himself a democratic socialist and he's been friendly with Jacobin and the left, um, but he's more of like a justice Democrat sort of branded candidate. You know, AOC sort of straddles that line as well between justice Democrats who are a little more sort of uh, progressive working within the Democratic Party and DSA, which is, um, uh, it has a strong socialist identity even as it runs candidates on the Democratic Party ballot line. These candidates are all, you know, very strong associated with and affiliated with DSA and are very open about their socialist, um, you know, political identity. And the fact that they cleaned the house almost in New York City last night and will be headed to the state legislature is phenomenal. Um, and it really shows that, I mean, it's, it's really heartening for us because Bernie Sanders, you know, obviously just got, you know, knocked out of the primary race. And then we were in the wilderness of the pandemic and there were the uprisings and it was unclear, um, you know, what was next. Um, and now it seems like actually we are going to have uh, more progressives and more democratic socialists uh, winning uh, in electoral politics going forward, which is really exciting. And I, I should add that, you know, we had one um, member of the New York state legislature, Julia Salazar, who was able to uh, play a major leadership role in passing the best New York tenant protections in decades just by herself. And she's a DSA member and, and a self-identified socialist. So imagine what it's gonna be like when she has, um, you know, Zohran Mamdani and Jabari Brisport up there with her. I think it's gonna be really incredible. And we're all, we're all feeling very buoyed by this news. And, and to focus on Congress or the National Congress, mm -hmm. um, how many people need to get elected to actually change the nature of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives? I mean, will we still see Nancy Pelosi as leader of the House in 2020? Or could progressives in the party become something other than a minority in the near future? I think it's very unlikely that progressives are going to become something other than a minority in the near future, because the establishment really does have a grip on Congress right now. And I think that we need to be sober about that. However, there are ways to behave as a political minority where you can have an outsized impact. And we already see that with, uh, you know, Rashida Tlaib and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar the way that they've been able to have an outsized impact on the American sort of political imagination because they garner so much attention because they do buck establishment trends and because they engage in these kinds of intra-party conflicts that actually heighten the contradictions and, and the tensions within the party. So we're not going to overturn the whole thing uh, this year or next year or the year after that, but we are going to build a bench of progressives and socialists who are going to continue to garner headlines and continue to change the way Americans think about politics. Uh, that was Megan Day, staff writer at Jacobin and co-author of Bigger Than Bernie with Mika Utrecht. It's a great book. We did an interview on a previous episode of Tisky Sour Full Hour with Mika and Megan on that. You should check that out if you want to hear more from Megan. Dahlia, um, this is exactly the kind of good news that we needed, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's been it's been incredible and it's been really interesting to see, especially again, those state Senate wins because they can really have such an impact on like the lives of local people, as Megan outlined there with the impact that Julia Salazar has had on sort of housing bills and stuff like that. And I think it, it's just very interesting to look and see what the Justice Democrats and the DSA are doing across the pond. They seem to be doing the strategy of very focused endorsements and resourcing of candidates that are extensively trained. And they're not spreading themselves out too thin, but rather they are sort of like really concentrating their resource, resources on so strategically important basis. So Joe Crowley, for example, who was the incumbent that AOC beat uh, two years ago was, you know, next in line sort of touted to replace Nancy Pelosi um, as House Speaker. And Elliot Engel is like on the chair of the Ho House Foreign Affairs Committee. So he again is like this very kind of like, it's not just any old in incumbent Democrat, but it's really ones that hold significant amounts of power. And we're also seeing a kind of better, sort of more mutually dependent relationship between candidates and movements, which I think is also something that when we look at comparisons to the Corbyn project in the UK, 
was something that didn't really exist as much. Uh, we see more, um, you know, involvement from Sunrise and DSA as being not just places and Working Families Party, not just places that endorse, but places that are key sources of power and strategy for candidates in winning and also once they actually do win so that, you know, they don't rely on the kind of networks and systems of information that that already exists. And I think especially like we, we often talk about this in relationship to something like open selections. And I think sometimes we have a tendency um, so like comparisons between primaries and open selections. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to actually overstate the difference between the US system and the UK system. So while you have this, this um, primary, th these primaries happening, um, these primaries were not, it was not normal before just Justice Democrats and DSA started doing this. It was not normal for there to be a well-resourced, serious campaign um, and of primarying against someone like Joe Crawley. Like that was not a normal thing to do. That was a controversial thing to do in the same way that we have some mechanisms for deselection here, but it's a controversial thing to use because of all these arguments around dividing the party, et cetera. But it seems that Justice Democrats and um, DSA have managed to kind of counteract that culture of any Democrat or any Labour MP is a good, you know, is, is the person that we want sitting and representing us. Um, and they seem to have really changed that, that culture. So I, I think it's very interesting to see how they managed to do that. But that wasn't something that we were able to do um, in the UK with Corbyn, because then when, when Corbyn lost, which we knew was, was something that could happen, um, it felt like we also lost the party as progressives. I think that's a really interesting point, actually, the difference is, you know, I mean, there are there are differences in terms of the rule book. So in terms of the argument yeah. for open selection, it was always that what would be great about open selection instead of what we currently have, which is you can uh, trigger a reselection process, mm. is that then you could have an incredibly positive campaign. So to get mm. Jamal Bowman on the ballot, they didn't have to do a purely negative campaign about Elliot Engel. They could say, look, we've got this inspirational candidate. We want to get enough yeah. people signed up to get this inspirational candidate on the ballot. And one, that mm. meant they could do a positive campaign. It also meant that replacing Elliot Engel is an inspiring candidate because of the negative yeah. system we have in in the Labour Party. Then you put all of your energy into getting rid of someone. And then who comes to replace them? I don't know. It's you know potentially someone who hasn't offended the right people. They might be really average. But I do, mm. I do accept that point. I do think you're right that potentially one thing they did was completely... You know, just take the hit. You know, if the establishment was saying you're you're wrecking the Democratic Party by, um, you know, standing against incumbents, they just said, look, we're not going to take we're going to do it anyway. And mm. so I think there is yeah. some of that attitude that we probably could, you know, bring on board yeah. over here. And and they put their money where their mouth is in the sense that they invest resources into ensuring that that candidate is a good candidate and they don't spread themselves too thin, but they make sure that they concentrate their resource resources with candidates that are winnable and have been trained really, really well so that not only do they have that solid chance of winning, because you don't want to run a whole negative campaign about a high profile Democrat right before they're about to go into the, you know, the, the, the national elections and have that be for nothing. You know, you need, it is important to win. And so I think that follow through of not just sort of comms or, you know, endorsements, but actually having the knowledge and the resources to make sure that these candidates are effective and that they will be backed up once they win and actually get in as well. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit jealous in a way because it's sort of, you know, what we had where we had the leader. So, you know, mm. our, 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 our Bernie was Corbyn, Corbyn won. And then the whole establishment was thrown at him before we had, you know, a broader movement really developed who could defend yeah. him. They've sort of done it the other way around. So Bernie's lost, mm. but they are now bringing up all of these sort of candidates who could insulate a future leader. Um, you know, yeah. so, I mean, that was always, yeah. I think, one of the strongest arguments for open selection is that it means that you can you can build up more autonomous forces. Yeah, and we had, and it keeps, it keeps elected officials accountable. And it means that, you know, we have these amazing, you know, the, the, MP, the one positive things that happened in 2019 was that we got some really amazing 
new MPs. And that is something that we could have seen, um, you know, at a much larger scale. And that would have that would have really softened the blow, I think, of um, of Corbyn leaving, because at least there would have been a sense of, OK, well, there's a new generation of younger, dynamic, movement connected people who could potentially take their mantle um in the future we're going to go to some comments so on jamal bowman matty says just to hear someone acknowledge that poverty is a deliberate part of the system is so refreshing i wholly agree um Fenavich with a 20 pound super chat i am living for your crystal clear analysis and doses of sanity crucial viewing viewing during lockdown times thank you so much we appreciate both the kind words and the 20 quid. Uh, very handy uh, for this show to grow. Um, yeah, thank you all for your donations. And if anyone else is watching for the first time, we're here every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, and M. Toussaint asks, why is everyone dressed like Michael today? I just I feel like a, a white shirt unbuttoned on a summer's day is a fresh look but i did when i was watching that back i was like when a guest comes on in exactly the same clothes you have should i go away and change should i ask them i can't ask <laughs> them to change i think you've just got to live with it um i'm not dressed like you you're i'm not. wearing a yeah. cute little blue spaghetti strap situation although i think you should dress more like me on these shows mm, interesting <laughs> i could I, I think i could pull that off um our next story we're going back to the uk this is a this is a grim one. Uh, coronavirus has meant many stories which would have been headline news fall by the wayside in terms of public consciousness. This certainly applies to the ongoing controversy surrounding the government's housing secretary, Robert Jenrick. Jenrick, as housing secretary, has the power to overrule planning decisions made by local authorities and the government's own planning inspectors. In January this year, he used his power to grant permission for this man, Richard Desmond, um, a pornographer and former owner of the Express newspaper. Maybe we can't get it up to build a one billion pound luxury development on London's Isle of Dogs. Um, so far, so suspicious, but it gets worse. Desmond needed Jenrick's backing as the government's planning inspector had advised against the scheme on the basis that it delivered an inadequate amount of affordable housing and that the height of the tower would be detrimental to the character of the area you can see Richard Desmond there now. So why did Jenrick overrule the government's planning inspector? Well, we can't read his mind, but it seems relevant that Richard Desmond, the property magnate in question, is a Tory party donor. His company donated to the Conservatives in 2017. And get this, he personally donated to the Conservative Party two weeks after Jenrick's decision was made. That does not seem like fair play to me. It still gets worse. God, there are so many elements to this story. So weeks before Jenrick made the decision that just happened to be of great financial benefit to Richard Desmond and then to the Conservative Party, the two had sat next to one another at a Tory fundraising dinner. Desmond showed Jenrick a promotional video on his phone for the proposed £1 billion development. This is hardly subtle, is it? I'll go to Dahlia in one moment for her thoughts. But first, there is one more bit of information. You need to understand the true cost of this cosy establishment free for all. That's because the day the scheme was approved, the 14th of January, was not any other day in the calendar of developers wishing to make a buck in London's most income deprived borough. On the 15th of January, the following day, Tower Hamlets were due to introduce an infrastructure levy on new developments to fund local schools and health services. It would have cost Desmond £40 million. But because his application was approved the day before the scheme came in, he didn't have to pay a penny. Dahlia, I can almost feel your blood boiling through my computer screen. What is your take on this sorry affair? Yeah, I mean, as someone who is probably going to be just like pushed out of where she calls home in a like very, very soon because of gentrification and because of the way that our housing operates in the city in London, um, this makes me particularly um, furious. And I think what is what I'm seeing here is this really rings very um, similar to the system that they have in the US where you have 
sort of major companies that have entire departments whose exclusive purpose is to network with and sort of make strategic donations to candidates and parties that ensure their interests um, are secured. So whether it's like a fossil fuel company wanting to build a pipeline through a particular area or whether it's, you know, contractors wanting to win contracts for particular infrastructural proje projects, um, we see kind of like this is very institutionalized in somewhere like the US. And here that the sort of um, donation system isn't quite as, um, you know, dramatic and isn't quite as big as it is in the US. But it, it, there is that worry again that as we are moving towards a more US style politics, that this will come, become more and more common. And when these kind of transactions are done under the cover of donations, which in the US, because of the Citizens United bill, um, giving donations to parties or to candidates counts as free part of free speech. So it's protected under the First Amendment. Um, basically, these companies aren't stupid. They know that they factor these donations in and pay for that kind of proximity to um, politicians. So, for example, we saw that in this instance where um, Richard Desmond and um, and Jenrick were seen sitting next to each other, like shortly before these these transactions took place um, at a really expensive dinner. So they'll hold these like really expensive fundraising dinners where it costs like. 200 grand for a ticket in order to be with a particular politician. Um, and they will only donate to particular candidates or particular parties, or sometimes they'll just donate to both sides of the ballot so that whoever wins, they know they've got them in their pocket. Um, they'll only do that if they're confident that they're going to have a return on their investment. So the, the amount that they pay in that donation compared to the amount of profit they make by, for example, being allowing it to pass before the infrastructure levy or not having to abide by the fact that we mandate that big projects like this have 30% affordable housing is incomparable. So they save so much money um, by doing this. And like I said before, you know, the most egregious part of this for me is the, is the fact that this was essentially used in order to circumvent the 30% affordable housing rule, which is if you think about it, the idea that new buildings, that new big developments that often take over from social housing that, you know, are done without collaboration or consent from the com local community are only mandated to have 30% affordable housing. You know, that, that in itself is already a tiny, tiny concession from the state. So the idea that these backroom shenanigans that rarely get investigated still that's not enough for them it's not enough for them that they can that they only have to give 30 percent of the housing back into the local community that is shaping how we live in our whether or not we can live in our neighborhoods and we see other kind of ramifications of this for example in Grenfell um, whilst it wasn't exactly this kind of scenario we saw a situation whereby the council was so corrupted that no matter how many times Grenfell residents raised concerns about the cladding and the fire safety in their homes, they were repeatedly rebuffed because there were wider interests at play, because the council was not there to respond to their needs. So this is sort of an, a, a part of our political DNA, as it were, right now. Um, and it's very, very worrying that soon it will this will become, as it did in the US, by fighting for that Citizens United amendment, they were able to make a lot of these practices legal, so it would be harder to hold people to account to it. But um, especially as we see, you know, the NHS potentially going up for sale, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of um, healthcare companies and companies that are looking to get their part of the pie um, and I know when Jeremy Hunt became healthcare secretary, there was that controversy about his connections to companies that wanted to privatize the NHS. There is this real worry that in these trade deals and in this kind of like, as we move away from the EU, that this will become increasingly part of our political DNA in a similar way to the US, which has been one of the single most destructive um, processes and um, parts of the democratic process in the US for a very, very long time. Interesting comments. Jayesh Patel says, I'd actually prefer the mafia to be running the country. 
Um, I can definitely see where you're coming from. And when I actually show you the next element of this story, I think that belief will only be intensified. Um, Kaylee Browncoat says corrupt housing development will be our only industry post COVID. In a way, it's been you know our only industry for a while. Many of you know all of these people that they're just probably these people don't really add anything to society. They buy some land and then they receive rent off it. Um, it's not difficult to build a billion pound project. You just have, a, have to have enough money to put behind it and then friends in the right places, which was the case here. I am going to introduce those further developments today. They are, again, shocking. So under, under pressure from opposition party, up, under pressure from opposition parties, documents relating to the decision were made public this afternoon. And they appear to confirm, not dispel accusations of impropriety. Um, so an email from a civil servant referring to the development read. Let's take a look at this. On timing, my understanding is that Secretary of State is, was, insistent that decision issued this week, i.e. tomorrow, as next week the viability of the scheme is impacted by a change in the London CIL regime. Uh, so that's the civil servant email in the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government. So that's very explicit. It was not a coincidence that this project was approved on the 14th of January. It was approved on the 14th of January and the Secretary of State explicitly said it needed to be approved on the 14th of January so that Richard Desmond didn't have to pay £40 million to local schools and hospitals, right? And you can see the wording there. They say, oh, it will affect the viability of the scheme. Now, this is a billion pound development on prime real estate. These people are making millions from this. And it's not, it doesn't become unviable if they have to invest in the community, if they have to invest in schools, if they have to in, invest in health service, or heaven forbid, if they have to let some working class people live in the building by having some of the housing as affordable. It doesn't affect the viability of it. It just affects how much cash goes into people's pockets when all they've done is have some money to invest in building it. You know, Richard Desmond did not design the house, right? He did not build the house. He had enough money to buy that plot of land, and now he wants to make a 20% return, even though he hasn't done very much apart from sit next to a Tory government minister. And if he has to let a little bit of that money trickle down into health services and schools in what is the borough in London with the highest levels of income deprivation, uh, he, he just doesn't want to. It's got nothing to do with viability. Um, uh, let's look at what else emerged from these documents. This is straight from the Guardian copy on the report because it was quite a recent story. Um, so the documents also show that Desmond, the former media owner and pornographer, lobbied Jenrick about the deal in writing and arranged a site visit for him. Desmond urged Jenrick to rush through the deal before the levy was introduced, writing, we don't want to give the Marxists loads of dough for nothing. Jenrick replied, I think it's best if we don't meet until the matter is decided. Now, the disdain, the disdain from this property developer, and let's remember, you know, this is not some, it's not some person who's lived an incredibly virtuous life. This is not Mother Teresa. This is a pornographer who used to own the Express and now uses his money to gentrify working class parts of London and begrudges giving any of his vast profits to services for local people. Also, Tower Hamlet's government are not Marxists. <laughs> they're, they're very moderate social Democrats, democratically elected by the people of that borough, which this guy is now introducing this huge imposing building purely to line his pockets. And this from Jenrick, I think it's best if we don't meet until the matter is decided. What should you reply as a government, of, you know, as the person in the country responsible for housing with the power to sign off whether a building gets constructed or not. You don't say, oh, I think it's best if we don't meet in person. You say it's completely inappropriate for us to be having a conversation like this, given the position of authority I am in and given the conflict of interest this introduces to this situation, right? You say, now that you've said this, I'm actually going to have to pass this case on to a different person because I am compromised here. That is what someone with integrity, with honesty, who cared about housing in this country would have done. What did Robert Jenrick say? Oh, I think it's best we don't meet. You know, maybe maybe it's going to be awkward when I do this huge favor for you if we're pictured together. It's pathetic. Um, I'm going to go to a comment. Zainab Adam says, Dahlia is so smart. Always a treat to listen to. Oh. We have similar mindsets. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, with this thing, I think also what I find really interesting as well is how just how tiny the pool of ownership 
is. So you have like this this one guy, Richard Desmond, who owned, who's gone from owning like the Daily Express, which is like not only one of the kind of biggest newspapers in this country, but is a newspaper that is responsible for so much division and racism in this country. It is single, like singularly one of the most toxic um, media outlets in this country, who can then go on to basically is now displacing people from a predominantly black and brown working class neighborhood. And it's just like, that's just one guy having that level of authority and ownership over the lives of people. But, and it's like, there's no way that the ideology that led him to, you know, own a, to own a newspaper that happily called drowning refugees cockroaches to this behavior of displacement through gentrification and this complete disdain for the lives and the needs and the democratic, you know, expression of this largely historically black and brown working class neighborhood there's there's a connection there and i think the fact that like obviously we talk about things being systemic and things being structural and that's absolutely true but sometimes it is just as blatant as like the same few guys with the same ideas run so much in this country that you know it's no wonder that that you know the clasp of ownership the gatekeeping is just so strong um and so this is really the tip of the iceberg of that i mean i think that's so true and it is really relevant you're absolutely right that it's so relevant that he owned the express right because people mm. always say oh yeah. why is that why are our newspapers so right wing and they say oh it's because that's what people demand that's what people do. That's, that's how you make money now most of these people most of these newspaper moguls they don't make money from the newspapers. The reason they buy the newspapers is for political access. It's because you then get to sit next to people like Robert Jenrick at fundraising dinners. And then you get the profit from doing something like property development, right? Yeah. The re people buy these newspapers for influence. Then they pump out toxic, divisive lies. And then they they make the benefit doing completely different things because now they're in the, you know, now they're cozy. They're mates with people who make important decisions in this country. Yeah. It's a return on investment. The return on investment of holding the capital of a newspaper like The Express is nothing when you compare it to the amount of money that can be made from the access and the advantages that you gain from having owned a paper like that. And it's the same one thing I wanted to say before as well is we see this again coming through in the revolving door between politics and business. So, you know, we see it con consistently whereby someone will end their tenure as an MP and they'll go straight into an advisory position or something in a company that often is working in a space that they have nothing to do with. Why do they often get hired? It's because they did their bidding while being elected officials and then have been able to leave with all of the contacts and the political clout and the political networks um, globally and nationally that they've accrued through that process of being an MP that they can then hand over to businesses and industry. So that's again, another way that we see that seamless connection between business and, and politicians that when you look back at events again, I bring it back to Grenfell because I think it's such a microcosm of how politics operates. What chance did the residents of Grenfell have against that when it's so tight and it's so slick? And that ends up, it ends up in this slow violences of something like gentrification, being gentrified out of your neighborhood, and then very, very fast violences, such as, you know, the, the Grenfell fire. We're going to go on to our last story in one moment. But first of all, if you're enjoying tonight's show, if you appreciate the journalism that Navarra Media does, please go to navarramedia.com forward slash support. It is our subscribers, our regular donors that make this organization possible. That mean we can continue to grow, can continue to get out these progressive messages. Um, so please do go to navarramedia.com forward slash subscribe or support. God, I say this every show and I sometimes get it wrong. Um, Ro final story. Robert Jenrick taking from London's poor to help Tory backing pornographers isn't the only political story that's received less media attention than it otherwise would have were we not in the midst of a global pandemic. While we've rightly, in my view, been focusing on the government's mishandling of coronavirus, another huge political story remains in play. Of course, I'm talking about Brexit.
That's right, because the government's refusal to ask for an extension to the transition period, even a global pandemic, has not meant a pause to the project that made Johnson's career. By the 31st of December, Britain will trade with the EU either on the basis of rules which will be agreed over the next four months or will leave on WTO terms. Earlier today, I spoke to the UK's foremost expert on the Brexit negotiations, Professor Anand Menon. I started by asking what he saw as more likely in the coming months, a compromise between the EU and UK or a disorderly no deal. It's hard to know for certain. What I would say is both sides are absolutely clear they'd rather have a deal than no deal. And my sense is that even if any deal is a very thin one that doesn't cover large parts of the cooperation we have now with the European Union, if you forced me to bet, I'd say we'd end up with some sort of agreement before the end of the year. And the key sticking point, it doesn't seem to have moved on much, is this idea of a level playing field. The Tories say the reason we wanted Brexit is so we have the rights to change environment, workers' rights, state aid rules, etc., etc. The, the, the Europeans don't want to be undercut. Have we made any progress whatsoever on this issue of the level playing field? Not as yet, no, in the sense that for the government, the point of Brexit was not to be under EU rules. It would be bizarre, they say, to leave the EU and still be bound by their rules. And so we need to find another way to make sure that we don't undercut their standards. Now, there are ways of doing this. There are ways of doing this in other trade agreements. You could have sort of trade remedies whereby both sides agree that if we think you're undercutting us, then actually we will retaliate, perhaps by imposing sanctions, uh, perhaps by imposing tariffs. So there are ways around this. And both sides, I think, can see where a landing zone lies. It's partly about who blinks first, I think. And I don't think much will happen till the autumn, I have to say, when the pressure really ramps up. And I suppose the big fear from progressives from the left at this point in time will be that this would have been headline news, you know, the, all of these negotiations that are, are happening. But they're, also, they're almost happening, you know, in the dark because everyone is focused on the bigger crisis, which is, is coronavirus. Do you think people should be worried that the fact that everyone's distracted means the Tories will be able to push through what would be quite an unpopular, hard right, de deregulatory Brexit? I don't think there is such a thing in the sense that... Brexit might give us the freedom to make our own regulations, but the whole point of Brexit is that then Parliament has to pass the new regulations if they want to undercut standards. And of course, we live in profoundly weird times, don't we, where a Tory government is wanting to escape EU state aid rules so it can spend more, have an industrial policy and all those things we used to associate with the left. So it's, it's a curious political time. There is a battle that will be fought at the heart of the Conservative Party over the months to come about the nature of any economic settlement after Brexit. There are people People in the party like Sajid Javid, who have taken up the Thatcherite mantle, want less regulation, want lower taxes, don't want to see the state take on huge amounts of debt. But there are others in the Conservative Party who aren't recognisably conservative in that sense, who want to invest, who are focused on the red wall seats, on public tra on, on public investments. Uh, so that's a fight in a sense that will happen within the party. And actually, it is an area of advantage for the Labour Party, because while the Conservatives are badly divided on economic policy, Labour is quite a cohesive force in terms of the kind of economics the party, its members and its voters want to see. Do you think the Labour Party were right to basically stay silent on the, in on the issue of the, the Brexit extension? I think it was probably good politics, yes, in the sense that whatever Keir Starmer had said, it wouldn't have made the slightest bit of difference. Let's face it, the CBI have come out in quite unequivocal language and said, this is bad for business and no one listened to them. So why would you listen to Keir Starmer when you've got a majority of 80? And in, in purely political terms, the Labour position makes sense. And that position is Boris Johnson said he'd get us a good deal. We'll take him at his word. Let's see what deal he gets back. And then we'll decide whether we're happy with the Brexit he's negotiated or not. And I want to push back briefly on, on a previous point, actually. You were saying there's sort of voices within the Conservative Party who what they want to do is is have more room to for state aid, basically, more room to support certain industries. And there's others who want to use Brexit as an opportunity to cut regulations. Is mm -hmm. it not a possibility that they do both at exactly the same time? So it's sort of right-wing Keynesianism, which is quite interventionist in terms of supporting certain industries, inflating the economy, but at the same time is is undercutting wages, undercutting environmental workers' rights and, and basically having a more deregulatory but ambitious state, as it were. There is that possibility, yes, you're quite right. I mean, what I would say is there are people in the Conservative Party who are wedded to deregulatory initiatives on the environment, on workers' rights. There are others who aren't. My bigger point was that here is an area where 
the Conservatives are very badly divided. We've got a report coming out next week that makes this point in some detail that the Conservatives are quite united around social values and quite divided around economics, while the Labour Party finds itself in almost exactly the opposite situation. So that's one of the reasons why it's quite hard to know what direction the Conservative government will go in, whether this sort of new Boris Johnson style conservatism has any economic meaning or whether they'll revert back to time. I genuinely don't know, but I don't deny the point that there are those people out there, you can see them writing columns in the Telegraph already saying, oh my God, look, we've had coronavirus, so we can't afford fads like environmentalism. So there is certainly part of the Conservative Party that it wants to use corona with the added help of Brexit, which, which frees us up in regulatory terms to cut back on the kinds of regulation that we have in place. That was Professor Anand Menon, Director of the UK in a Changing Europe, and another guest who was wearing exactly the same clothes as I was. Uh, the, the coincidence goes on. Maybe I need to wear something other than a white shirt. Um, I've dressed the same for the last three days. Um, it's because I, I wear just sort of like a shitty t-shirt to in, in some of it, and then I change. I, I changed into a, something nice for the for the evening. <laughs> um, Dahlia, your comments on Brexit will move on from my sartorial concerns. Um, obviously, this has you know taken a back seat in terms of our our attention and and the media in general's attention. Is that a relief for you, or are you worried about what is going to get negotiated in the dark? I mean, it's it's deeply worrying, of course, and I think the I completely can see. Um, it, it's not surprising to me that we are sticking to this 31st of December uh, deadline because I think that Boris Johnson has lost a lot of political support in his handling of the coronavirus, particularly um, and particularly in a lot of those red wall seats that the Tories won at the last election. So I think, you know, he is very, very keen to get the narrative back on Brexit as soon as possible because that's where he thrives and that's where he sort of, again, as you said before, made his political career and the issue upon which he was elected as prime minister. Uh, I think my worry again, and the professor sort of outlined this, is what are the issues that the Tories are united on? And they are united on that kind of um, ending freedom of movement, uh, bringing, you know, recently attacking sort of the small steps that were made in favour of trans rights, um, that kind of, again, socially, very socially restrictive, racist, divisive, um xenophobic politics and i think that if if we are to go with um the professor's sort of outlining of the tensions in the tory party between and i think that this is a general thing that's happening in the right worldwide which i guess is the the kind of more keynesian um familiar like sort of uh let's invest and 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 do all of the and sort of invest in in infrastructure and stuff like that versus that kind of deregulatory or sort of creating the conditions for big businesses to thrive. Um, my, for me, either one of those is, is a problem. The, obviously, there's a long reason why the kind of neoliberal deregulatory agenda is harmful to working class communities, etc. But I also think that there's a serious worry here that we will see the rise of the kind of economic, what Steve Bannon called the economic nationalist agenda, where they use a lot of the language of the left, for example, of investing in the people, of, um, you know, uh, stimulating, stimulation of the economy and, you know, and in all of these kind of languages, this kind of language, investing in healthcare, investing in housing, but their definition of the people is very restrictive. You know, their definition of the people is very much the citizen, the white, per, you know, white people, heteronormative people, um, you know, cisgendered people. And so using that kind of um, into more interventionist, more Keynesian style economics in order to justify a very, very, very worrying um, division on the basis of race, nationality, gender, sexuality, etc. And I think that that is actually possibly more of a threat to the kind of world that we want to see than the neoliberal deregulatory side, which I think is a wholly unpopular one now. So I think it's that that the concept of that winning and that taking over the spirit of the Tory party, um, that kind of economic nationalist agenda scares me much more. Um, and I think it's something that we need to keep an eye out, especially 
when we think about putting forward our arguments that things like we have to talk about things like immigration, we have to talk about things like race, we have to talk about these issues because they are what stands in between that kind of investing language um, being appropriated for really, really horrible ends to having it to using it for liberatory ends where everyone has access to the means of life. So I think it's really important that we understand that that is the issue upon which the right is united and upon which I think they will gain a lot of power, especially when combined with an economically popular agenda. So we need to be really careful about that, I think, as the Brexit negotiations come up. That was a very powerful note to finish on. And we're going to end there on time. Uh, which is unusual. Um, thank you, everyone, for your super chats tonight. If you do want to support us directly, then you can go to navaramedia.com slash support. Thank you to Dahlia. Gabriel, as always, you've been brilliant. Um, we'll be back on Friday night at 8 p.m. So do hit subscribe to make sure you never miss a show. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navara Media. Good night.